How do I, is it just page down for this? Just making sure I know how to, okay. How to make it go back? Okay, all right. All right. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Cherry Kizon, and I'm presenting this paper on behalf of myself and my co-author, Fe uh, Magbayo Bagaho, who could not join us. Uh, uh, she is a retired biologist in the Ateneo de Davao, and as you would have read in the um, um, bios, right, that she's actually currently right now the uh, back um, at the biological collections, right, taking care of the biological collections, which is kind of like Fe's baby, right. And so uh, this paper is really a small part of a larger study and I'm fo we're focusing this particular one just on the plant identifications uh, because we feel that that's important. So uh, let me begin. So indigenous peoples in Mindanao are often visualized as men and women dressed in denotative ceremonial attire, clothes that signal belonging to specific locales or territories or membership in a particular ethnolinguistic group similar to Benedict Anderson's observation on the generative power of certain images as a kind of logo, quote unquote, for a newish nation. Mindanao itself is sometimes signified by colonial era photographs of its autochthonous inhabitants, a pattern that we observe, right, with this digital material such as the one used um, in this particular conference. Now, I couldn't resist doing this, so I'm doing this. Uh, so clearly, this image shows us um, a Bagobo family. In fact, on the lower left, there is a, a caption that says Bagobos-Family Davao PI, which leads me to believe that this was probably um, as one of those souvenir postcards that people would purchase, right, and send on. And it's most likely to be, right, uh, definitely early American period. Um, and so I thought that for this kind of narrative, when we actually see it as some kind of, you know, emblematic of the indigenous peoples of Mindanao, I couldn't resist. So I said, well, let's look for other, my work being with the Bagobo, Tagabawa, Ninjangan family images. So I got this on Facebook, right? Uh, and this one is a picture of a young girl um, in Jangan Bagobo dress. The Facebook is the Bagobo Klata public Facebook, um, and they just called it at Kalina in Davao City, which also tells me this is a Jangan girl. So certainly photos of themselves dressed right in the traditional clothing is certainly significant and important and has some kind of, you know, memorializing content. But I also couldn't resist including this, which was sent to me by Viber, uh, uh, of, of essentially my godson Datu and his sister Kai Kai, uh, in contemporary dress taken just uh, within the month of June, uh, to kind of give us a sense of, you know, how these photos actually have many possible purposes, right? But my task today is actually not going to be talking about that. A particular kind of work, but another aspect of this work. So indigenous textile, textile practices in Mindanao are certainly synchronously distinguishable from each other uh, by resultant cloth and clothing styles. It allows us to accurately characterize individuals in a historical photograph, such as we saw before. The concept of group-specific style or attributes organized more than a century of photographic and museum collections and publications, which include some of my work, for, for instance, on Mindanao cloth and dress, both in colonial and post-colonial contexts. So there's lots of work on this, right, from Cole and Benedict in the American 20th century, as well as Reyes, um, Roses, um, uh, afterwards, Larhoven. There's a lot of work that thinks about Mindanao in terms of this notion of group style. So it's not necessarily an empty referent. However, the concept of group style has limitations when dealing with phenomena that transcend social boundaries. Interdisciplinary historical and cultural studies examining translocal long view social processes in Mindanao, not bound to group specific material practices, provide some uh, insight, whether through the framing of zones of plural interaction and indigenous agency. This is kind of like what Hayas is doing with this whole notion of right, uh, East Maritime. Um, uh, Southeast Asia, or Edgerton in northern Luzon, or Paredes um, um, among the Higaonon, or theorizing episodes of stochastic political and economic engagements, such as what Abinales right, does, as well as Tew. So uh, in this paper, we focus on what I call indigenous, what we call indigenous textile practices, which we define as, I'm sorry, I should talk a little bit more about this before I leave this. Um. So this, just to give you a, a real kind of quick primer, right, on um, Mindanao textile styles. On the extreme left, you have here um, in the upper, 
Uh, and at the bottom, two are two examples from her own private collections. Um, she's uh, Jangan Bagobo herself, but her husband is Tagabao Bagobo, and I met her in the Tagabao Bagobo territory, right? So she would identify as Tagabao Bagobo until I asked her, and then I find out she's Jangan too. So that's, these are two pieces in her collection. So the centerpiece is um, what the Bagobo would call the Ginayan or the Kinaino, right? Which would be a three panel uh, skirt, which is a high status skirt. Um, and then on the middle, you will see the Mandaya one panel dug my cloth. So in the Bagobo, you would have them in, sewn in separate pieces, the center panel being the mother panel and the reds are the, what they call the bata, right, the child panel, whereas the mandaya would make this in one entire single panel of cloth. They don't kind of sew them pieces together. Where you would have the crocodile motif in the bagobo one separate and the mandaya one incorporated in this larger panel. So they're both crocodiles, but you can see that stylistically they're quite different, right? And of course the mandaya call their cloth, the baka cloth, the mai, uh, the bagobo do not. Um, and then on the far end would be an example of tiboli, uh, textile where, and this is a very special one because it shows Lang Dulai, those of you might know who Lang Dulai uh, was, the late Lang Dulai, it shows her interpreting a signature, so he actually, actually signed her work, right? But I'm showing it to you here because it's an instance of the Tiboli tricolor style, so the Tiboli can actually um, do ikat, yeah, doing three colors in one particular warp row. But that's not the focus of this, but just to show you that it's certainly not an empty reference to talk about group style. There is such a thing that we could talk about as group style. But we're thinking here of something that kind of underpins the notion of even creating something in terms of style. So in this paper we focus on what we call indigenous textile practices, right? Which we define here, pattern material processes and social arrangements are organized around the production of cloth and dress. So these processes um, tend to produce culturally distinct clothing assemblages, which we can describe as group style, that can express or delineate identities of historically marginalized people, but they're not constituted by it. Uh, we more narrowly focus on plant know-how in this particular paper as part of material processes and observe through social arrangements that make their utilization as well as collection and documentation possible. Uh, in the title of our paper, we even call it rather grandly botanical knowledge, right? Uh, there, uh, therefore, we think of it as it consists not only of information or unusable or desirable plants, but also the practices such as labor sharing arrangements that make such knowledge actionable, right? So that's what we mean by knowledge. It's, it's knowledge that's actually actionable. So uh, we're interested in textile-specific plant knowledge that may be generalized regionally across culture groups, while also maintaining awareness of distinct ways that local communities organize, make use of, and transmit such knowledge. We broadly draw on anthropological and historical ideas that consider macro surveys of material culture at the regional level, such as, for example, what Brodel is doing right for the Mediterranean, or Brodel wants to do right as far as that kind of history from below. Cultural histories, both of resource used by normatively invisible peripheral populations, such as like Eric Wolf does, right, for the, what he calls peoples without a history, and the specific challenges and opportunities in interdisciplinary method and theory in the interpretation of material evidence from archaeological and ethnobotanical fields, such as the work of Ian Hodder, right, in archaeology, uh, Yarrow Ludwig um, in ethnobotany, and so on. Uh, so, uh, well, the methodology that informs what I'm presenting actually occurred in kind of three phases, right? So the first phase, uh, when I started this work in 1993, it was really interesting because everyone would tell me that there's no more weaving, um, and therefore I'm going to end up with an empty set. So I said, okay, fine, if that's my finding, that's my finding, but I have to start somewhere. So it was a survey and sampling in 1994, and at that point in time I had to kind of decide on you know, how to limit or how to systematically define what I'm looking at. So I said, well, let me look at what kind of a production is still happening out there in the historically known communities that do, uh, I'm interested in abaka and ikat, so abaka the banana fiber and ikat the technique. So in 1994, there was a survey of Bagobo, Tagabawa, and Jangan, those are two subgroups of the Bagobo today. There's a third one, Ubo, which I was not able to study. Uh, the Mandaya, the Tagaoldo, Tiptoboli sites, uh, I didn't include here, but I also was able to visit some Zimblaan sites, which I mentioned right in uh, your previous panel, um, 
only in the Malungon and Matanao area. And the second phase was mixed methods, right? In this case, I decided that I was going to work only with a uh, multi-site between two uh, Tagabawa, Tagabawa and Jangan, for Gobo sites in 1997. And finally, community-based shadowing, photography, and specimen collection. So the first two phases have actually already been published. Um, and so I'm just going to summarize our findings from there. It's the last that, we're, that I'm presenting. But Fe and I are presenting, right, um, in this case. Uh, by the way, Fe has basically helped me in, with all my plant IDs from the get-go. Uh, she was introduced to me by a friend, a mutual friend, and her generosity has sustained me quite um, over the years. But let me summarize the earlier phases that have been published, right? So the first thing, uh, by the end of the first two phases, we know that there is a broad distribution across regions of what I call an indigenous semantic category. Right, of prestige abaca cloth. So in other words, across the region, and I'll show you a map in a little bit, right, there is an understanding that there is this separate category. Uh, it's an indigenous semantic category, right, of a prestige category of cloth, because the peoples of Mindanao are major textile consumers from, for centuries, right? So they've always been consumers of textiles as well as producers. So this is very specific category, so that's the first. And the second is that there's a narrower distribution of people who actually still own them or use them, right? and an even narrower distribution of people who actually still make them. Right? So that's the second. And the third one, it's established by phase one and phase two, is that there is a shared plant repertoire. Right? Um, and so I've known this, it was in my dissertation and all that, but, but we've not really set out to actually establish this right, in this specific way, which I feel is important and, um, and, and fair. Um, that's true. So here's kind of like, it's not a very pretty map, it's a kind of like, you know, homemade map with PowerPoint, right? So bear with me. But essentially it's a schematic map uh, that shows to you, so all of the areas named here, right, uh, going, I'm going left to right from the Zamboaga, Misamis region, Western Mindanao, where you have the Subanan, right, uh, then going counterclockwise, Kalinan, Talomo area, Sibulan area, Bansalan area, Lake Cebu area. Uh, coastal southwestern Mindanao, western Gulf, Malungan, Matanao, Caraga, Lamiawan, and finally um, Agusan region, east central Mindanao. Um, uh, these represent what we would uh, would uh, correspond to the first phase, right? This areas which there is this indigenous semantic category, right, of ceremonial cloth, right? It exists. So you might go to those spaces and they might not have the cloth anymore, but if you show them pictures, they will say, yes, we know that, and that's for this purpose, right? So that's very, very important. So, so this first phase is like really a semantic thing. It's not necessarily a physical thing. Uh, so I call all of these regions of heritage use, right? So there's a, this category in people's heads, right? This understanding of, of the importance of the cloth. Um, and then the red bits are the places that I actually visited, right, in the first phase of research uh, in the attempts to kind of determine, right, uh, where there is still some production going on. Uh, so, uh, so the Caraga Lamiawan area would be the Mandaya. Um, the Mandaya, of course, are in all over, but this is the place where I went. Malung and Matana, of course, their Dla'an are more widespread, but that's where I went. Then we went Kalinan, Talomo, Sibulan. So it's, this is really basically snowball sampling, so I would go where people were willing to have me, right? That's kind of like how it worked out. Um, so this is kind of like a schematic map of this prestige category, right? Wh which people understand Abaka Ikat to be important, indigenously, right? So, so not for collectors, although collectors like him too, right? But it's indigenously um, speaking. So for wed weddings, they have to be important, right? So for certain occasions, they have a certain significance. Um, the yellow bits um, are the areas of what I call, you know, active production, right? So the Mandaya areas in the Karagalamyawan area, whose work ends up right in Davao City, in the, just mostly at the Lake Cebu area, of course, whose work ends up not only in the Jansan City, but also in, in the Davao area. Those are the areas of like the most active um, uh, weaving, and much of it goes, is in, in, implicated also in the uh, tourist industry, right? So that's kind of what's going on there. So we're looking at plant use in this prestige category of textiles, right? So when you go to these areas in Mindanao, people who belong to indigenous cultural communities, um, they tend to not look indigenous in our, in our minds, right? So you go there and individuals self-identify as belonging to one of the many autochthonous groups in Mindanao can appear to be fully assimilated. So they would look like they're fully assimilated into settler populations. However, field research since the 1990s determined that this special semantic category, right, is, is very, very important and it persists. Uh, this category is sometimes referred to by the Cebuano Visayan term karaan, right, uh, which means ancient, antique, or archaic, or by the neologism among the Tagabawa Bagobo, costume, 
you know, costume, but they say costume, right? I used to think of costume as just costume in English, but it's not. It's a completely different term. It's a term they use for outsiders to talk about their cloth. But when you revert to Tagabawa, they talk to you in, right? They call them umpak bagobo. So it's very, very different, right? Um, so it includes, so this category of karaan stuff or costume, right, includes tailored garments, uh, jackets, shirts, head, shoulder cloths, as well as cloth not intended to be worn. So these are actually two types, right? Cloth to be worn and cloth that is not to be worn. So cloth not to be worn are usually hung on the walls. They're usually like what we call the bride wealth um, cloth, but not for all groups. It really depends on the particular group. So ikat pattern pieces made of uh, abaka, musa textilis, sit at the very top of this classificatory hierarchy. Some groups use these only for dress, and some these use, use these only for uh, today, anyway, since the 90s, right, uh, for not for dress. So it, the patterns are specific to each group, uh, each uh, locality. Consequently, the cloth known by many groups' specific names, for example, Tinala Kintiboli, Dagmai, and Mandaya, and are distinct from special um, garments they are made with, for example, bride wealth grade women's skirts or tabi mlato, right, mlaan, or sinod ginayan, or sinod sabadgato, sintagabawa, right, um, they kind of confuse us, right, because they're all these different names, but they actually refer to, you know, different categories um, of textile, some dress and some not, but for sure they all share this kind of like a baka ikat kind of um, matrix. The characteristic red and black ikat motifs are derived from endemic dye plants, red from Morinda citrifolia, and black from Diospirus nitida, which we'll discuss below. So the cultural value assigned to ikat pattern abaka cloth is affected not only by the scarcity of finely made vintage pieces, but also the degree of difficulty and expense in commissioning um, a new one. So in our study of plant use, we had, we're focusing right on plants used to make abaka ikat. So, how do I define active weaving communities? Um, so the, the, sh the shortest way to say this is that you know, when you get there, we basically do snowball sampling and interview different people, right? So we s distinguish heritage ownership, right? We already know that. So families that actually own pieces because it was passed down to them or it was acquired through past bridewell exchanges, right? Um, heritage ownership tends to also be mapped to economic ability. So well-off families tend to hold on to their pieces. Economically challenged families tend to lose them. Even if they don't want to, there's always gonna be a story of some no good nephew that stole it from their grandma and sold it to the shopkeeper, right? Without their permission. So you always have those types of stories, right? So that's part of it, but that's their people who, who own them and use them, right? Active weaving communities um, also include owner users, but they're more narrowly distributed, right? And so by active, I mean like if we went there, is there evidence of weaving concurrently? And the ones who do weave or knowledgeable weavers, have they re recollections or participating in the making of any cloth in the last 10 years, right? That's kind of like the general way we'd do it. So ethnobot ethnobotanical research conducted around the same time by a fair, right, around the Lake Cebu area. She was working with the Obo, right, uh, who live in the area surrounding the Tiboli. Um, she also learned from them that the Obo supply dye plants to the Tiboli, um, spe specifically canalum leaves, right, um, uh, because you need copious amounts of it, as well as morinda. So though botanical domain knowledge cannot be fully studied and understood without the collaboration of weavers and dyers, such knowledge is clearly not limited to craft but practitioners, right, and may be fruitfully investigated in broader populations who directly engage with culturally relevant textile practices. So, so they might not weave themselves, but the obo supply, right, uh, and the obo value the cloths, right. So, so we have to kind of clarify these things when we speak of, of weaving and, uh, you know, who weaves and who doesn't weave and who owns and who values, right, those are very important things. And the first and second phases of research also established that the shared fiber in that plant repertoire among the extant weaving, oh sorry, uh, this one uh, shows you the Cibulan area where the initial collection of, of actual dye plants were done. And then I had a photo album and I used that to go to various areas in the Bansalan areas where we actually did this um, specimen collection, right? So uh, it's a table that's been previously published except the new bit now is that it's Diospirus Netida, which was not known before and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So, but in this particular table we summarize we summarize, right, uh, the terms, right, the first column is the, the terms for the Bagobo Tagabawa, because that's the principal group I work with. 
Uh, so for the dye plant, it's sikarig, but if you go across, you'll see that the Bagobo Jangan have their own term for it, kalig, the Blaan we call it lagu, the Tibolo loko, and so on and so forth. Right? So it's important to understand that right, each group will have their own names for these um, plants. So the first phase of research right, that took place in Bitaog um, uh, produced, maybe I can skip ahead to the next slide. Um, Okay, yeah, so this is the, the dye plants that were, were um, basically brought to us and we photographed them, right? This was initially in Sibulan, right? So you would have abaka, I'm using the Tagabawa terms here, right? Boo, sikarig for the morinda here, kinarem, which source of black, and then the lumber for the tree, which is pola, right? And the lumber is bahi, which is also a Visayan word, but it's also the term they use for the lumber, right? So those would be the sources um, for those. So these identify these four as like the major plants. Um, you would say, for a baka ikat um, production. Um, so the collection of plant materials uh, in each visit was, so, so basically what happened was, because I, I only have five minutes, right? Uh, basically what happened was uh, once we, we used this album of photographs, right? When I went to the Mandaya, I went to the Blan, and I went to the Poli, right? To basically determine, right, so what's this? And then they would immediately identify, right? That's Kinarum, right? that, that's Sikari, right? So, so it was non-controversial, these four right, major plants. And so there was no additional botanical whatever work done in those areas, except in instances when they would identify a plant that wasn't here. And so I have, for instance, if anybody in the audience is right, would be interested, I have a whole bunch of plants that we don't, yeah, we, we don't have such specific IDs for the Mandaya, for example, um, as well as uh, other groups, right? So, but these are they're the four that are consistent um, across all of them. And so once we knew of this um, in 1997, um, we conducted, I guess looking back, we didn't think of it that way, of course, but it turns out that that's essentially what happened, right? Um, Salinta Munon, uh, many of you know her as one of the Gawad Manilika Nambayan from the Bagobo. I was actually the one that, that nominated Salinta for, for this award. She's late, Salinta Manon died in 2009. She was my principal informant. Um, Salinta agreed to be shadowed. Uh, and so uh, we commissioned her to make some cloth f following Tagabawa Bagobo, instances of commissioning a new cloth being made. But the new bit was to ask her if we could also document her in the process, right, of, of dyeing the cloth and therefore learn about the plants. So um, that process, um, I, was assist I was assisted in this process, of course, in the second phase, right, by Doris El Nakano, who's a Tagabawa Bagobo from Davao City. Uh, Miguel Ito Bancas, Jangan Bagobo, also from Davao City, uh, who eventually ended up getting married right? <laughs> afterwards. And so the, the two kids at the beginning, the, those are their kids, and well, this is my grandson, and they, uh, my godson, and they call him Datu. Um, and so they were the ones that uh, basically um, did this, but it was Salinta who determined when they would come, and she was assisted by affiliated households, the household of her sister. Um, Indo, her brother, uh, Ugtog, who is a blacksmith, and one of her married sons, um, Saiko, uh, up in um, Bitaog. And so it was her that basically said, okay, now you come, and then they came, right? So the whole process was essentially determined um, by her. And the specimens were collected based on Fe's input. She told Dorisel what was needed, and it was brought over to Ateneo uh, de Davao um, uh, for photo photography, ex situ photography by Fe, and then... Um, uh, for depositing. So what are the results? Uh, um, I gave a copy of this paper to Christina as well, right? So basically, right, no no, no um, new information, but we do determine, right? It's, it's basically Musa Textilis, right, for the Abaka. Again, the first name you see there would be Tagabawa, but the alternate names would be Wo'o for, right, Jangan uh, Bogobo, Lutai for Blaan, right, Abaka or Lanot for Mandaya, etc., etc. Um, Arecaceae, uh, right, which is the Pola, Cariota Rumfiana, for loom lumber, right, and that's also a cross group, especially for the, for the beater, right, the sword, the, the weavers call it the sword, the great big um, uh, sword in the loom that's always across the board, it's always made of, of lumber from the Cariota palm. Uh, Morinda citrifolia, which is kind of well known all over Southeast Asia as a source of red, um, Diospirus nitida, again, this is the important one, that it's nitida, right, not all the other, uh, not posiflora, it's nitida, because of the small fruit. Um, uh, and again, nalum for the jangan bogobo, kinalum for the blaan, kinalum for the tiboli, kinalum for the mundaya, right, kinaharum for the obo, right, so we have all these specific local names. Um, and then we have some minor plants. So the colorants, these are field photos, not from Bitaog, but from earlier phases, right, uh, uh, kalawag, uh, which is a, uh, 
um, well known to everyone, kunil, kunib, right? It's this yellow ginger, right? And then of course, Tagalog is called this uh, achuete, right? Daluga, right? Daluga, which would be the, the source of, these are the minor colorants, right? Um, but more minor plants, which is very important, would be the mordants, right? So Morinda citrifolia is a red source, and for the color to stick to the cloth, uh, you, you need to add other plants that would actually make it stick to the cloth. And so all over Southeast Asia, Morinda is used, but what's unique is that Morinda in Mindanao is only used on abaca, right? So Morinda on abaca is completely different from Morinda on cotton. <clears throat> so these are the mordant plants, Asangi, uh, Balia, Libagod, right, um, that were used, um, added to the dye bath because Morinda dyeing takes quite a long time, like a couple of weeks of dyeing and redying, right? However, what's interesting is that the way you get black is very easy with the Osprus nitida. When you compare it to Southeast Asia, the way they achieve black on cotton is usually through indigo, and indigo requires mordants as well. But for some reason, the Osprus nitida does not require mordants, so black's easy to get. Right, so black is so much easier. And I make the argument in another paper I'm working on, right, about the aesthetic impact of um, getting black easily and how difficult it is to get red. Another minor plant, I like it, is the bottom right, is packaging plant. It's a big leaf, a locasia, very common, right, used for wrapping the root. And in the middle is a bunch of plants used for what's called the ritual bundle, right, after the dyeing, they actually hit the dye threads with it. Um, in order to make sure that the color doesn't go away. Um, the, the bottom is my favorite. It's called the Oli Oli because they say um, you hope that Oli Oli is, you know, to, to, to actually not forget. You hope that the fiber doesn't forget the color you put in it, um, which would be uh, red. Uh, so, a bunch of generalizable statements we can make about translocal shared plant knowledge and local aesthetic expression, right? So, we know that there's a shared plant botanical inventory, right, across producing groups in Mindanao. I haven't done any field work um, among the Subanan. I would love to have people do that, and if people have, I would love to know more about what they have. There's some publications about them, but there's no plant information on that. Um, this was done through multi-phase collaboration with indigenous specialists. Um, I've been having a conversation with Una, and this was before FPI. See, so before the whole informed consent processes. So this was like an old-fashioned way of, of doing it. Um, uh, but it was through essentially the notion that you as a researcher are there as a guest, right? So, so it's really about this notion of guesthood, right? Um, material processes and social arrangements. So when we think of them, we have to think of them not just as things, but also the social arrangements, right? That make these things meaningful. Um, Generalizable practices also vary when you get to the local level. And finally, that there is, a, I would say, a textile grammar that ultimately shapes specific meanings, valuations, uses, and distributions of ceremonial cloth, which is really quite specific um, to Mindanao. And that's the end of my presentation. Any questions while, uh, oh. yes, please, yeah. Well, Basilan is quite well known. It's a yakan. I think you're thinking of the yakan, right? Um, the, the Sulu and, and Maguindanao and Mananao have a, a, slight, a much different kind of dynamic, right? But Basilan, uh, I don't think that they've stopped. I think it's still going on, but perhaps you're not as aware of it. Um, but it would be cotton. They would be using cotton and silk, imported silk if they have it, right? Yes, it would be cotton. Uh, there would be some homespun cotton. What's interesting is that uh, Maguindanao, for example, and Maranao know of abaca, but they, they say, and Tausu also told me this, they look upon abaca as a low fiber. It's like, it's a low status one. Uh, so it's used for right, poor people, right? Uh, although I do know that Dagmai uh, has been mentioned in some of these uh, shipping uh, you know, uh, lists as, as an export uh, item, right? Um, but, but yeah, when, it, when you talk about abaca, right, then they, they're aware of it, but it's not seen the same way, right? Uh, whereas for these communities, it's actually, you know, they, they write poetry, right? They sing songs to welcome the cloth. It, it's seen in that very special way. But, but for the people, uh, as far as what I've been told, right, from, from Slu and Maguindra Marana, uh, abaca cloth is, not, is nothing compared to, especially to silk, right? Silk is the, and the Indian trade cloth that, that they actually care for. We'll have a few more questions after, but let's have Carlito. 